of the PSENG True Diversity Film Series at NJPAC. Welcome to part two of our Where Do We Go From Here discussion. Hopefully you turned in for part one on Monday, where we heard from a dynamic panel of young leaders. Tonight, our esteemed panel comprised of masters, mavericks, and mavens in the arts world will share their perspectives and insight on the current state and the future of our field. The source material of tonight's chat was the two-part documentary produced by the Oprah Winfrey Network, also entitled, Where Do We Go From Here?, which looks at the extraordinary events of 2020 with the range of Black leaders, artists, and journalists. The purpose of this series is to bring the community together and to encourage everyone to take part in the powerful movement to ensure civil rights for all. NJPAC's launched a series of events and initiatives focused on promoting racial equality. Please visit our landing page, njpac.org slash stand, where you can find resources that will help you take action and join us for conversations and discussions that bring light to the issues we're all grappling with now. Join us to learn more, do more, and help our nation achieve the more perfect union it has always promised. I must also thank our advisors, um, the North chapter of the, double, of the NAACP, and the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice for their guidance. Though this event is taking place online, NJ Pact is built on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, the elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We must also acknowledge that the grounds upon which NJ Pact stands were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the voices of many indigenous and oppressed people. We acknowledge that the teaching of US history in schools, cultural institutions, and the media has left out many voices and difficult truths in order to create an idealized nationalistic identity. We acknowledge the struggles of the oppressed peoples, those actively and behind the scenes working to make our country honor its guiding principles of equality, liberty, and justice for all. We acknowledge and honor that Black Lives Matter. This acknowledgement demonstrates our commitment as a community working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of colonialism, oppression, and systemic racism. Before I introduce our esteemed panel, please welcome remarks by Michelle Gonzalez, the Senior Regional Public Affairs Manager for PSENG Nord, the corporate sponsor of this series. Thank you, Katab. Good evening. It is my pleasure to invite everyone to this wonderful engagement. My name is Michelle Gonzalez. I'm Senior Public Affairs Manager for Newark at PSCNG. I'm honored to be here tonight to welcome everyone to this evening's discussion on where do we go from here, the arts. PSCNG and the PCNG Foundation has been a longtime supporter of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center and its programs. In 2015, the, the, the PSCNG Foundation provided the initial funding for the PSCNG True Diversity Film Series, Jasper, Texas, in what was the start of a discussion series that addresses very sensitive topics that provoke broad thinking on issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity. This series reflects PSCNG's commitment to Newark and the many communities we've operated in. A tremendous part of the commitment is our support for organizations such as NJPAC and what that support means for diversity, for education, and the arts. Early this year, in the wake of the tragic killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the demonstrations that followed in cities and communities around the country, the PSCNG Foundation announced another commitment, the Powering Equity and Social Justice Initiative. The initiative is part of PSCNG's foundation's $1 million commitment to support organizations that address the racial injustice, inequality, and human rights in the communities of color in New Jersey, New York, and anywhere PSCNG operates. Both as a company and as individuals, PSCNG supports, empowers, and invests in the people, economy, environment, and infrastructure of the communities we serve, embodying our mission to help build better places to live and work. We believe our longstanding support for diversity, education, and the arts help us contribute 
to that ideal as well. Thank you and please enjoy the discussion. I'll be turning back to Kitab Rollins, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And now our moderator for the evening, the inimitable Donna Walker Kuhn, an award-winning thought leader, writer, and strategist for community engagement, audience development, and social justice. Donna is the president of Walker International Communications Group, a 30-year-old boutique marketing, audience development, diversity training, and social justice consulting agency. She is also my colleague, a senior advisor of community engagement at NJPAC. She's a lecturer, keynote speaker for, and keynote speaker for arts conferences worldwide. She's also an adjunct professor at NYU, Columbia University, and Bank Street College. Donna serves on several boards, including Signature Theater, Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation, and she's the vice president of the board of Newark Arts Council. Donna is also an author. Her first book, In Addition to the Party, Building Bridges to Arts, Culture, and Community, was published in 2005, and she has just completed her second book, Champions for the Arts, Lessons and, Su and Successful Strategies for Engaging Diverse Audiences. She has a weekly blog also, Arts and Culture Connection, that explores cultural efforts to expand diverse audiences. Donna. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. My goodness. Good evening, everyone. We are so excited to be with you this evening and to explore this important topic. Um, before I introduce the panel, I wanted to just uh, share a few thoughts that I have on this subject. Um, one of them is from Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, um, one of my favorite people and thought leaders. He says, without art, there's no empathy. Without empathy, there's no justice. The arts have the power to lead us forward, to heal us, to bring us together and help us bridge real divides. The arts are the key to building and rebuilding bridges in our society between cities and rural counties, between the poor and the prosperous, between the past, present and the possible. So as Katab mentioned, this past Monday, we heard from a group of panelists ages 15 to 25, sharing their perspectives on where do we go from here from the perspective of being youth. And they talked about the importance of being heard and being given space to speak, develop, and create. This evening, we will discuss the same question, where do we go from here from the perspective of these seasoned arts and arts professionals who have contributed many years to their crafts, and they too are at a turning point amidst these days of racial protests and pandemics. I'm particularly inspired by Oprah's documentary um, because the thought leaders that covered such important topics such as anti-Blackness, segregation, white privilege, apathy, policing, the police, and moral leadership, and the importance of addressing racism and being willing to address all these issues that interlock with justice. And I've been deeply moved by the profound and steady flow of voices of protests and demands for racial justice that have emerged from the international arts community in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Artists and arts administrators of color have been speaking out in every facet of the arts industry, from theater, museums, dance, music, visual arts, and in countries from all over the world about the need to be treated with respect and to have equal access to opportunities. So this united call for justice across many disciplines is shaking up the arts world. As we know, artists have historically been at the forefront of social change and deep cultural shifts. And once again, we're demanding a seat at the table and to be heard. But I cannot recall in my lifetime ever seeing the vestiges and wounds of social and racial injustice being made so clear on so many fronts at the same time as what we're experiencing today. So let's meet our panel. First, I'd like to introduce Hope Boykin, who needs no introduction. I'm sure you've seen her gracing the stages of Al Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater for many years. But Hope is an educator, creator, mover, and motivator. And she's danced with, not in addition to Ailey, with Philodenko, um, of course, the Ailey Company, where she just completed 20 seasons, and she's a choreograph choreographer as well. Our next speaker, Erin Dworkin. 
Aaron Dworkin is a 2005 MacArthur Fellow, and he was President Obama's first appointment to the National Council on the Arts. He's also served as Dean of the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance, and is a lifelong musician. But Aaron also founded the Sphinx Symphony, which is a gift to the classical world. So delighted to have you, Aaron. Linda, Linda Harrison, the director and CEO of the Newark Museum of Art. And Linda, since she's been here in Newark, has guided this museum through numerous changes, developing real estate strategies, and revitalizing the museum's campus. Thank you, Linda. Sharnita Johnson. Sharnita is the arts program director at the Geraldine Dodge Foundation. She directs the foundation's arts portfolio, which fosters a diverse and vibrant arts ecosystem. Sharnita also co-chairs the newly launched New Jersey Arts and Culture Rediscovery Fund, which has raised close to, I believe, $3 million to support artists uh, during this pandemic. So thank you all and welcome to NJ Pat's Social Justice Panel. So first, I would just like to ask a question of the panel, um, which you can shape your perspectives on this topic. And then I have questions for each of you individually. So my question is, what do you think of the protest groups and movements that have developed since the murder of George Floyd as a reflection on how the arts sector needs to respond and advance with these principles of social justice? Would you like to begin? Linda. I'll, ju I'll jump in there. I see you uh, smiling. Uh, <laughs> um, that's because I'm so happy to be with uh, my uh, co-hosts. This is a, a, a wonderful um, evening. Um, I um, am really um, moved by um, our protesters because um, not only um, we have the COVID-19 pandemic, this is the civil rights pandemic that our protesters um, are, have taken to the streets and the real change comes from when you take to the streets and then it allows um, some of us who are not marching to really activate ourselves and be active in um, the movement and this is this I think um, uh, is where technology um, has assisted us because everyone is aware of uh, this horrible murder that happened and it has had us take a serious look at racial and gender equality and equity um, in our own organizations and, and what is it that we um, can do. And so it, it particularly with um, the museums, um, our cultural institutions, and, and I'll speak on the uh, museums, we can be behind the times. Um, we have been behind the times in change. Um, we make incremental change and uh, think that that's good enough. But this movement, um, uh, the protests, the um, uh, really formal, uh, what, what I would say, the peaceful protests uh, that um, happened here in Newark just really helped us um, uh, wake up that we can't be the institutions that we were. Um, prior uh, to this um, murder and prior to COVID-19. We, we just can't. If we, if we continue um, to be these, um, the institutions that we were, we'll be closed. We will no longer be relevant. And this is where we've had to lean in and actually say words like racial equity. Um, and um, what does it mean um, in an organization that um, particularly for us that we, we like to show you the art and you have wine and cheese and then we let others uh, do the fighting and we can't do that anymore. This, this is where this fundamental shift has happened in our industry. My fellow colleagues um, uh, and myself, we know and, uh, and I'm personally driven by the change now must happen. Um, we're, we're temporarily closed uh, now and when we reopen, it must be different, but it's different even now in our everyday discussions, whether it's with a trustee, with a stakeholder, with an artist. Um, well, it, it is just now, um, I think our responsibility as a cultural institution to really support the artists in making a change within our industry that's going to actually just have us um, uh, have um, uh, 
a better place, if you will, on breaking down um, systemic um, exclusion. It's, uh, it's all about now systemic, creating systemic inclusion. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. I like that. Systemic inclusion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to just agree. Number one, thank you for inviting me to participate in this conversation with this amazing group of people. Um, and I agree with Linda that the, this has really um, caused the arts and culture community to sort of rethink the way that they operate, mm -hmm. rethink the way that they are producing, rethink who they're doing this work for. Um, I think, you know, artists as artists do always rise to the occasion. I don't know any revolution that did not have the arts, the protest movement, the protest, protest music of the civil rights movement, the arts reflecting. And honestly, I think that the arts community is going to tell the story of the pandemic in a way that no others can. They'll tell the story in a different way than journalism, than media. Uh, it will be the soul. They are already producing work that is telling the story of the protest, telling the story of what's happening in communities and neighborhoods around this country, the music that is coming out of this movie, the spoken word um, poetry that is coming out of what's been happening over the last year is really telling the stories, the untold stories really of communities that sometimes don't have a voice, of communities that can be perceived as monolithic. Um, and I think that again, the arts community has, um, this is a clarion call to the arts community because as Linda said, some of these arts organizations may not have much relevance if they don't start to think about who are they making art for, who are they welcoming, who are they excluding, yep. um, and, and who is documenting this incredible time in the world really. And the arts has kept many of us sane I know I've binge watched a lot over the course of this pandemic. I have enjoyed music. I have looked at art. And I think many of us have received healing from experiencing the arts and engaging in the arts as much as possible. I know the organizations that I work with are producing content online. They shifted immediately. Um, the museums and the dance companies and the theater companies have been the life's blood, I think, for a lot of our sanity. They've certainly continued to engage with children and, um, and older people around keeping them engaged, keeping them, um, keeping them, their spirits alive. And I also think that the arts is you know, it's, it's all about healing. It's about community connections and no other sector can do that in my opinion, better than the arts. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to, um, to, to first, I guess, discuss a personal aspect because mm -hmm. uh, being a performer and standing on stage and waking up as a performer who stands on stage every day as a black woman, <clears throat> I knew my life mattered. But the importance of me to remind other people wasn't as prevalent at the time. And then I had to think, am I wearing this blackness as an accessory? Am I just using it to do what it is that I do? I'm telling my stories on stage. I'm telling my mother's stories on stage, but am I doing enough? And I think that also within the organizations, the artists, I am completely included, have had to reshift and renegotiate what it is to stand up for what we believe in, even when, what, even when I know that I believe in myself. You know, I know what, that I believe in the fight that my mother, who was, you know, in her late 70s, um, graduated from college in the middle of the civil rights uh, movement. She stood up for something, but then there's always this, make sure you do, make sure you, make sure, don't rock, because she did the rocking. So she doesn't want me to be shifted in and out of place. And now she had to actually say to me, don't let me make you not stand up for the, pe the person that you are. And so then as 
a member of a company, as an educator, as a person who is who is uh, standing in front of the room now, the Zoom room, but standing in front of the room, I'm called to remind people, even as I remind myself, that I have to take a stand. And then when we continue to make this swirl, this tornado effect, then mm -hmm. the organizations around us don't have a choice but to follow. Because what is not okay is making a statement and then letting the statement fall you know, at the bottom of the pile of the list of things that the other statements that you want to make and you've just forgotten this one. So what the what the artists, what the organizations will have to really face is what the artists will allow and what we won't allow anymore. Um, because I am, if I'm waking up to myself, then everyone else is waking up. And it's not because I was afraid, I just didn't feel like I had to scream at you who I am. But clearly, I've got to remind people who I am and what I am and why I've worked so hard. And mm -hmm. I think that along with the organizations, it's going to be the artists who do the fueling of making sure that the shift remains shifting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Karen. Well, uh, I'm, of course, just honored to be able to be part of su just such an extraordinary group of, of thinkers, of artists, of leaders. Um, and, you know, when I think about the protests, one of the things, and I think kind of as a, a social entrepreneur, I think about pragmatically, how are we going to get to where we want to be? Mm -hmm. and, and so to me, the protests have, have brought more widespread awareness of a lot of issues that all of us knew within our own communities, but having that more widespread awareness is so important. But then I think ineffectual if it doesn't actually result in policy changes, in changes of employment, in all mm -hmm. of these things that we want to see. And so to me, that critical piece is how do we translate the energy? How do we translate the passion? How do we translate the visceral effect of seeing a human being murdered in the middle of the day, right, on a public street in our country, how do we translate that into not just how do we make sure that doesn't happen again in that specific community with that specific police force, et cetera, but how do we translate all of the um, uh, disparities and um, and racial inequalities that we've seen in the arts, how do we translate that? And so to me, that's where now this bulk of our work needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, because I fear a new administration coming in and everyone's like, oh, whew, the, we're not racist anymore as a country. Everything is fine. It's all good. Oh. Okay, Whew. that was a crazy year, 2020, but now everything's back to normal. We're not racist or not, everything's okay, right? And that we will lose the momentum that mm -hmm. we've seen. I've seen some shifts. I've seen conversations, mm -hmm. not complete actions in many cases, but definitely lots of conversations that I never saw in the past 20 years happening at major cultural and arts institutions. So now we have to make sure those conversations translate into policy changes, staffing changes, artist curation changes, programmatic changes. And I think if we can make that next step, and at this point I remain completely optimistic, but I worry that the energy will diminish, that new issues will arise. And I worry that we will again become more of a fringe issue rather than what I think was accomplished this year, which was to say, this is a priority, not just for a particular community, but for our society as a whole. Mm. Thank you. You know, I think that is such an important point because you're right, there was a fever, you know, so after this murder, we saw, you know, unparalleled protest movement. So it's the translation of that. So what's next? And that has to become policy that is instituted that as Linda said, be, becomes the path to systemic inclusion. Um, so yes, thank I, you. you. You know what, I just want to add, add um, because um, uh, Aaron really spoke to the heart of uh, 
uh, these conversations now um, uh, that are difficult conversations that we're having um, mm -hmm. and with an institution, then um, we actually have to have action because we're real good at studying the problem. And yes. we're, we're really good at, uh, we'll get to it. Um, and um, from a museum standpoint, we're really good at not being advocates, not being just standing up um, as Hope said, and really it's gotta be in your face. And um, this is part of what we have now had to incorporate this, whether it's in a staff meeting, um, whether it's in a trustees meeting, actually saying, this is the action now we're gonna take. Um, and something as simple as us putting up a chart that shows the percentage of the art collections that we have that are um, uh, by white artists, versus BIPOC artists, it actually made some people in the room nervous just to have this chart up. And it's like, well, if we don't talk about this, we certainly won't have this action behind changing that ratio of that pie chart with regards to our collections. And if that is going to happen, if we're sitting in this community, then we've got to look at the BIPOC artists have must be enhanced, improved, um, uh, uh, um, expanded, not to eliminate what we've had, the, uh, the white artists, but to expand uh, the collections um, by BIPOC by artists so that we actually are telling the untold stories. And, and this, this, this simple little thing um, yeah. is part of how we get there um, in terms of the action. And it's these Mm. The, 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 it builds on uh, the action where an institution has to be as flexible and, and as nimble as our artists. And how about listening to the artists? Yeah, that's a, that's a little new thing for us. How about that? Right? Can, I, can I just quickly add on to that? It is so, so to the, to the point, Linda. And one of the things as you were sharing, what you said makes me think of Chimamanda Adichie and her famous you know, quote about the danger of a single story and that the danger of a single story is not that it is untrue, but that it is incomplete. And the stories we are weaving in the arts are incomplete for sure. Mm. Wow. Aaron, I wanna continue with you because you talk a lot about the arts as a business. And I know that in your classes, you teach your students as artists to also be entrepreneurial. And so as we dash into this 21st century, how do you feel we should encourage artists to adapt this entrepreneurial spirit? Um, and, and, and along with that, you had said in, a, in an interview um, that you said that the art form will become more diverse and inclusive. So when you look at the world, there's no choice. And so you said it has to open up or it will wither and die. And institutions have to intentionally look at this issue. So you've got this institutional issue of EDI and then this entrepreneurial spirit for artists. So do they meet and how do they move forward together? Yeah, so uh, so two sides of, of such an important issue. So yeah. one, certainly for any aspiring artists, um, arts administrators, I think it is not even, we're way beyond encouragement. I, what I tell my students is you must have these entrepreneurial skill sets you must have the ability to build a sustainable enterprise around your art making. If you're a practicing artist or if you're building an entrepreneurial career or an administrative career where you have what everyone basically has in the arts, a portfolio career, um, you must be intentional and you must have those skill sets. Otherwise, it will be virtually impossible to build a sustainable career unless you have that. Um, and then on the institutional side, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's just the reality of all of our major, you know, metropolitan regions um, that either already is the case or will be very soon, which is that they're majority um, people of color, mm -hmm. and um, and institutions that uh, don't look at that purely from a business perspective, right? So let's put aside the humanistic aspect of DEI of of EDI let's put aside the 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 sense of what it means to from my perspective to be american and this true melting pot 
uh, and all of the ideals of our nation that we have yet to fully live up to. Let's put all of that aside. And let's just say, hey, we're a 10 million, maybe $20 million business or even smaller arts organizations, 5 million, even 1 million. We are operating in a region that is majority people of color. As we look at how we're gonna sell tickets, how, who are we gonna fundraise from? Uh, you know, how are we going to be able to create both earned and contributed revenue? Just from a business perspective, anyone who's a responsible business leader is going to have to look at these issues. And um, obviously my hope is that it won't just be a numbers reason, that there'll actually be some of the, the humanistic and sense of community responsibility and, and all of that that's part of that. Um, one of the things that, that I mentioned, and, and it is astounding because it is a statistic that I shared at the outset of Sphinx 20 years ago. And that was that less than 1% of all of the works performed by all American orchestras are by any composer of color. That statistic is still true today as we sit here. Hmm. It is unacceptable and unlike a lot of other aspects to this work of inclusion that are pretty complex. When we look at say representation in orchestras on stage, there's tenure, there's screened auditions. There's, it's not that we can't do it, but there is some level of complexity. We have to develop initiatives. We have to certainly invest resources, all of those types of things and love to have those conversations. But when it comes to the repertoire that's being performed, there are two people, primarily one, the music director, and maybe also, depending on the structure of the orchestra, the CEO can make that decision tomorrow. Yes, there are players committees and those players committees can provide impact, but literally any orchestra in this country beginning this next month could have 10% of all of the works that they perform be by a, say a black or Latinx composer. There is absolutely nothing preventing them from doing that, including even money. And by the way, just for any orchestra that might say, those works don't exist or we're not sure. There's org many organizations, including Sphinx, who would be more than happy to share with them a variety of repertoire that would be more than appropriate for their audiences and their orchestra, mm -hmm. right? So there are these things and that's where I feel like we need to stress having these conversations with large institutions is a lot of times they'll say, well, we'd love to have, you know, 30% of our orchestra be BIPOC, but we have screened auditions. Definitely, let's do that. But before that, why don't we tackle some of the easier things? Your mm -hmm. staff turnover, average tenure is two to three years, but yet your representation on staff is equal to that in your orchestra, which is five times the level of tenure, right? So mm -hmm. let's talk about the things that are easier to tackle. And so I just think that there is a huge difference between public statements of support. Yes and of, um, of affinity for the issue and actual policy changes and or commitment of resources, i.e. this percentage of our budget is committed to mm -hmm. this DEI work that we are doing. Um, and mm -hmm. years ago, I think now it's uh, actually, I think at least a decade, I encouraged funders to actually peg their giving to arts organizations by some level of evaluation Absolutely. of their commitment and the percentage of their budgets that are expended relating to this. If it's a priority, we have to spend money on it. Um, and, and people in the arts were, were kind of averse to metrics. A lot mm -hmm. of times we're like, it's about the arts. It's, this is, we're not like that. You know, we, this is about how we feel. And yes, the art is, but how we present the art, how we frame it, how we employ people, how we curate the art, we have to be able to look at those metrics to understand where we are on a trajectory towards our That's goals. Right. That's right. Wow. Thank you. You packed a lot of information. Sorry, in yes, I did. Well, that, that was a class right there. <laughs> Thank you. I thought, based on what you were saying, I want to go to Sharnita because you talked a lot about funding and funding responsibility. And so, Sharnita, just continuing this conversation, you know, how do you? How do you look at funding and the grant criteria 
to fulfill the EDIA value and principles that Aaron talked about? You know, how do you look at that? And at the same time, what do you think about foundations that are now giving, you know, specifically for communities of color and have, and have designed um, really smart initiatives such as the Ford Foundation Cultural Treasures Program and the Black Seed Initiative that, you know, the $5 million program to fund Black theater for Black communities from Black-led organizations. How do you see that uh, aligning itself as well? So that is a lot to pack into a question, Donna, but I'm going to try to tackle that and say, um, so I'm going to qualify my answer and okay. say that there, this work and certainly in philanthropy is cyclical. So we're, this is maybe the third go round of attention to diversity, equity, inclusion, and it probably really started as diversity. So right. I think now the conversation has certainly changed. Um, I think that the conversation is much broader. I think it's much more inclusive of a lot more foundations and other funders, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, previously maybe it was one foundations initiative or two foundations initiative, but now sort of collectively, I do think that the philanthropy sector is paying attention. Um, I think that they are collaborating and learning together in a different way. Um, you know, many foundations certainly have come out as well as corporations with statements following George Floyd's murder and the uprisings this summer. Um, and the, the real question is over time, where do we see those dollars going? Where do we see the investments? So um, I think one of the statistics is that 80% of philanthropy dollars go to 2% of arts organizations. And most of those organizations are Western European uh, focused institutions. So mm -hmm. there is an extreme inequity there. Um, and when we really think about, um, in many ways, it's not a pipeline problem. So I think that there is often sort of the notion of, well, we can't find anybody. And that's one of the issues is that philanthropy leadership, less than 2% of foundations are led by a person of color. So once we get into those roles, the, the work changes, sort of the focus changes. However, it's a, a very small group of folks that get into those roles often. So as well as we're all thinking about this notion of we can't find the talent. Yeah. Um, I don't believe that it is a talent problem. It is a hiring problem. Yeah. We have talented arts administrators. We have talented artists. We have people with these skill sets. Um, that can work in these institutions. However, they get they don't get those opportunities like other people get those opportunities. So um, there's you know often black and brown people we get internships, we get fellowships, we get all kinds of but we never get the job. So the real question yeah. is how do we get those hiring managers to mm -hmm. see themselves in someone who may be unlike themselves and put them in these roles because by and large people of color are more connected to their community. Um, as we know with arts organizations, BIPOC led organizations, they tend to work with BIPOC artists, they tend to work in BIPOC communities and they tend to hire BIPOC people. So this notion that there needs to be sort of this fundamental shift and as Aaron alluded to, there's turnover all the time in these roles. Um, there's opportunities in organizations and institutions all the time. And the question really is, how do we get folks in those roles? So I think that that's part of the, the equation is that mm -hmm. we need more BIPOC leadership in, in the funding arena. Um, I think we've, we're be, we've been having sort of this deeper conversation, not about diversity, but really about equity and really about racial equity. So the notion that we can even say now, racial equity, black people, white people, that next people. So those are just words that were not necessarily, they were in, in many ways taboo, ironically. Um, mm -hmm. But we're, you know, we're calling a thing a thing as Iyana Van Zant says. And it's important that we have these conversations and, and speak our truth. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think that, yes, it's really incredibly important that we have these funding initiatives, that we have, uh, resources dedicated to this work. 
But mm -hmm. what we need to have is dedicated resources over time, just as we've invested in different kinds of communities, different kinds of art forms, different kinds of institutions. This needs to be a long game. So we need to not have in another 15 years looked back and said, oh, well, what happened? We, we, we didn't miss, you know, we missed the mark. We didn't land where we wanted right. because you have to be really intentional about that. Yes. Um, and so I also agree with Aaron, this notion of sort of funding um, organizations to do this work. I don't think you should have to fund an organization to do the work that they should naturally be doing. So if diversity, equity, and inclusion is important to your institution, you will find the dollars to invest. You will spend the time to learn. You will get those new skills. So I think, again, it is important that philanthropy stay the course, um, that this not become sort of the thing that we're doing now, because I do believe we can make this fundamental shift in this sector um, we can support organizations. The Dodge Foundation has, we initially committed to equity, but now we've committed to becoming an anti-racist organization. And that's a major shift. Um, it is a major shift for any organization, but certainly for a foundation that has for many years been very traditional in its funding and it, in its work. And it's very powerful. It's very powerful for me to be a black woman in philanthropy to say mm -hmm. to someone, my organization is committed to anti-racism and all of those things that follow that. Wow. So um, while I, I have great hope that we will stay this course, that we will continue this work, we really have to look at those fundamental things that will uh, allow us to have the staying power, such as looking at who's in the C-suite, who's around the board table, who's leading these organizations that is how we stay have uh, staying power and that is how we sustain these shifts okay i hope everyone's taking notes because i certainly am thank you that is absolutely i couldn't agree more thank you so from the artist perspective madam hope one of the things um, that I, in doing the research for this, you know, I came across a quote from Misty Copeland, you know, our, our uh, prima ballerina with American, she was American Ballet Theater, yeah? And she said, you know, racial justice protest, protests make her feel like I'm truly being heard. And then in an interview, she said, you know, how the ongoing racial justice protests are unlike anything that she'd ever witnessed in her career. And she believes that her work has just begun in terms of taking steps to combat racism in the dance world. And so I'd like to hear your comments on that, you know, combating racism in the dance world, your experience with that, your perspective, your thoughts. What do you think? Um, along with this masterclass that I've been getting tonight from yes. this panel, um, I, I'm really happy that you asked that because we in the dance world, and I'm sure in arts in general, are always or have always dealt with systemic racism, whether we knew it or not. Um, in this field in particular, you had to, uh, one should look a certain way and mm -hmm. one should be made to fit in a certain mold. There are um, books that mm -hmm. actually say that a ballet dancer, and I'm, I'm classically trained, but I call myself a modern dancer who was classic, classically trained, but mm -hmm. a ballet dancer should have a small head and that her uh, uh, thighs should be the same size as her calves. And I just would like to know in what world that that <laughs> is going to, you know, be vast for the majority of people in the world. No, that's isolating anyway. So already the, the that, the field, that particular sect of dance, ballet, has put um, uh, a cap on who, once upon a time, they said could do this work. Well, what, you know, if we go back to um, Raven Wilkerson and, and, and mm -hmm. Janet Collins, and mm -hmm. I mean, just, just look, look and scope back Arthur Mitchell, Joe Myers Brown, uh, Dolores Brown. Mm -hmm. These people were, given opportunities which started to clear paths. And then now we're in the position, if I, if I put my own spin on what Misty said, is that it is our duty to widen the path. 
But here's the thing about widening, widening it. We can't throw it away. We can't throw the form away. And right. I am very, um, I stand really strongly on this platform that it's that yes, ballet was the ideal which was someone's idea and that the aesthetic that is joined with ballet is chosen by the aesthete who the one who chooses to be concerned with beauty. Mm -hmm. Who is that? It could be me, right? So as I am, as I am a part of this widening of the lane, there's no reason to throw out the form. We need to throw out the misinformed. We need to throw out the people who are not teaching the ba teaching ballet for every particular skeleton for mm -hmm. every human body because mm -hmm. you could speak to me in pelvis you don't have to tell me to drop my butt you could say let's lengthen this stand mm -hmm. up on your standing leg rotate so then you're speaking mm -hmm. to the frame you're not speaking to the person that you see in in front of you that's and i think that's how we start to shift and make change mm -hmm. but we also have to teach young people um that that change has to happen from what they're learning but our my four runners in in the dance world also have a, a um and i say it i say it in a way that i know that we're moving forward but very similarly like my mother when she she did this work so she wants me to do what i need to do stay calm so i can continue to move and sometimes the 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 fear that we get is coming from our own and so we have to be careful not to inflict the pain that was inflicted on us Mm -hmm. inflicted on them on the next group. We've got to open up and keep it broad so that the artists can continue to grow and be told no matter what, that they are perfectly and beautifully made and they can do whatever it is that they set their minds to do. Will they always land in the company that they want to dance in? No. I mean, I, I feel like I am an exception. I was able to break down a certain barrier with my own story behind it. When I joined Philodenko, Joan Myers Brown said, you will not dance until you become in your best body. When I got to Ailey, Miss Jamison said, there's certain ballets you won't, you'll, you won't do if the costume doesn't suit your best body. She never said my body wasn't good enough. She just mm -hmm. wanted me to be my personal best. And that's all we really can do um, in, in, a, in a certain sense, that's all we want from the artist is for them to be their best, not isolated because of an ideal, but we have to recreate what the idea is to continue to move forward. And so as I am a part of this widening lane, um, uh, creating these paths, I know that young people see me and they want to say, oh, because of hope, I can do this. So then that pressure is a little bit um, more difficult, but it is my, uh, I say this sometimes and I really don't mean it in any kind of way, pun completely intended, but I am properly named because I'm supposed to continue to bridge the gaps between what someone doesn't feel like they have and what they can't and then what they can do. And I will take on that responsibility. Not every day it feels great, but right. when you see people fighting for something and I've got an opportunity, then it's my, it's my turn to bring you into an opportunity that you may not have had. To pick and choose open arms wide, you know, being a part of educational programs, being able to say, I'm a black woman, being able to say this should be anti-racist, being able to say anti-racism and sexual harassment, they seem equal to me. I've never, I, this is random, I'm sorry, but I've never spent, I'm artist in residence at a university, and I've never spent as long trying to get through a sexual harassment course so that I could actually go to my class. I was like, gosh, I didn't answer properly. I, I should answer. I know what's offensive to me, but I didn't make the, two hours this, this, Pat, this test is that I have to pass to be able to teach in this university. That the same attention needs to be paid to anti-racism, the same attention needs to be paid to the work that, that so many have done for so long. Because what the strength of black people, the strength of black women, 
um, is that we continue to do the work because we're called to do the work. So you tell me that one thing that hurts my feelings, I dodge that arrow and I still work. I get pushed back and I still work. I fall down and I'm still working. And we shouldn't have to fight for more than what we're hired to do. We should be able to work and, and build and grow and be encouraged in the work that not just dodge arrows because we want to continue to press forward. And yes, I know it's been a long time coming, but this and this panel and the master classes, we can do this work and it will not end. You know, we, we have to continue to do it and can, and not be afraid to stand up even, and not be afraid to stand up and also not be afraid to be told that we're not doing enough. Thank you. You know, that perspective as an artist, oh, it's so powerful. Thank you, Hope. I hope you're in many environments to inspire young dancers with that statement. We just got to put you on a tour. That's really great. Thank you. So, Linda, I want to talk to you about, you know, as a leader of an important cultural institution. Of course, in this pandemic and racial protests, we still have to generate revenue. We still have to raise money. Um, and so I want to ask you, you know, from these past nine months, you know, that we've all been struggling with, how have you, you know, tried to sustain your, your museum? You know, what have been those revenue streams um, looking at new stages, new virtual spaces? You know, how have you had to be creative? You know, how did you galvanize your team to be able to continue looking forward in that direction? Well, I, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm just enjoying listening to <laughs> everyone on the on the panel and and uh, really there's a connection um, with all of us as as you know Donna that I, this is probably why you brought us uh, uh, together and being a leader um, we uh, of a major institution an arts institution that is um, really known as a traditionally white institution and I'm um, a, a black leader that that was uh, brought in a couple of years ago. Uh, to really help transform um, this um, uh, the museum, and there's 110 years of a really solid foundation, but as Aaron said, it is now time to actually have an action. Um, and uh, as a CEO, and I I can tell you of the 250 fine arts museums around the country, there are only five persons of color as CEO of those museums. The Newark Museum is one of them. And, um, and I have the fortune uh, to uh, lead this organization. And so it is a, um, a combination of a balance uh, between um, philosophical decisions uh, and financial decisions. Uh, and uh, COVID-19 hit and we um, uh, have lost pretty much a third of our revenue. Yeah. And we had to, rather than pause, we said, we're really going to continue and lean in um, even more aggressively uh, with our programming. And that, that programming had to be through the equity and gender and caste framework, that lens. We, we had to look at everything that we do. Um, through this. And fortunately, this was a lens that I had coming in um, a couple of years ago and we started this work. Um, but I go back to Aaron's comment on you just have to make the decision. And when you are a person of color leading a major um, institution, and now it's time for you to make that decision, you've got to be fearless. And yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of this uh, uh, of uh, just policy um, and a decision that uh, we make museums. We have certain endowment funds that are restricted only to purchase um, uh, additional art objects that really help us uh, tell our stories and to tell these expanded stories. Uh, we just recently made a decision. Um, if we, we were buying three um, uh, pieces of art, one was going to be Biza Butler, not going to be. One is Bisa Butler, the, the quilt uh, um, uh, artist who, I mean, she's been on the cover of, of Time. The New, um, uh, she's just on fire. Hmm. But this was a surprise. It's like, nope, we're buying Bisa Butler and we're buying Micheline Thomas. It's not an either or. 
Okay. We're gonna and, and we're gonna commission Nicolene Thomas to do a piece of work. And then and we will also buy uh, an, a piece of art by a uh, non-BIPOC. But this change, this is how this the discussions around an institution being able to do this, because look, this is the only way it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And this is how then um, these artists um, will move and each of these artists are on their trajectories um, in their own way. But we have to say, this is how we're gonna do it. And not just because we are in this civil rights pandemic. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we have been traditionally, this is what we've done. But uh, when I go back to that pie chart that I said, our American art, because to us, these BIPOC artists are American artists. And someone like a Wendy Red Star, who is from um, the, um, uh, the, she is from the, oh, um, uh, she's an um, uh, indigenous um, artist. Uh, I'm forgetting the tribe, but it, it's just escaping me uh, right now. And we really had to look at having her come. She's a feminist as, well as an artist um, from an indigenous tribe. It's like, this is what we have to actually make these decisions to move it, to move forward. And from a, uh, uh, when we do make these kind of decisions and it is tough to make these decisions when an institution has traditionally felt, well, we'll get there, but no, we have to be there now. Then um, we're able to say, okay, now we can um, have programming that allows us to speak to these various audiences. I mean, um, we just had um, uh, astronaut uh, Marie Jameson yeah. in conversation with Marie Jameson. Well, this is what you have to do because people need to know that here, this black astronaut, this woman, um, she is a, been a major force in science. And um, uh, the, uh, this is part of how, if we produce these programs, which we went, it, we leaned into these digital formats and, and we've been producing programs much like yourself. I think the cultural organizations were really good at making that pivot and producing yeah. a lot of uh, content. It, it's almost like we're Netflix now, but we yeah. have to look at it through the lens of telling the untold stories, the untold programming that mm. happens. And in that, um, this is where I think technology has helped us. We can rapidly um, uh, do surveys that tell us what's working, what's not. Um, and we're finding that we present a lot of the programming free, but then we're finding out from our data that uh, we're able to take something like uh, escape room, connect uh, the concept of an escape room, to our um, uh, historic house. We have something called the Ballantine House Historic mm -hmm. House. Um, and uh, we found that um, our audience really responded uh, to this. And this is something that now we can charge for because now the data is telling us not everything uh, that we have our digital audiences are they um, uh, that they're paying for. But when we come back, the data tells us this is a team building. It was not only fun to do, you understand, you learned a little bit about uh, the art in the Valentine house, but also it helped us um, uh, to uh, be able to say to our corporate customers, mm -hmm. this will be something that you can purchase from us because we know how to do this. So we're, we're, um, constantly looking at, I think the digital world has allowed us to look at um, different revenue streams. Yeah. Um, and that this is something um, that it's also simultaneously allowed us to um, educate and um, really expose more of our artists of color. Uh, mm -hmm. this, this is an area that uh, we were, mm, I'll say uh, we could do better in. This is where that um, uh, racial, gender, caste, equity framework that my uh, colleague Sharnita um, has, uh, they leaned in and provided us uh, with a framework that we are really looking at in everything that we do. And so I think we're thoughtful, um, but we have to be fearless 
in terms of these new audiences that we are living in and we have to listen. We have to listen to the artists and what they are saying uh, that they want to see more of. And even our, our, our audience is responding really positively when we give them these untold stories. When we set up the programming so that they are discovering um, new artists, um, different ways of thinking um, uh, of how we uh, may uh, present um, a different story and our collaboration, because um, we just can't be the place that you look at pretty pictures on a wall anymore. People, there's performance, the dance, there's, the, there's these different um, the music, the the visual art, the museum is just not the place uh, where that's the only um, art we will give you something that you look uh, uh, yeah. on the wall. And, uh, and we're finding out that um, it's just much more expansive for us. Uh, when we have, um, uh, when we go digital, uh, we've had a, a really um, a great growth in our collaboration with our museums in Hong Kong, a museum in India, museum in Puerto Rico. This be, because really people want this beautiful um, inclusive content. It's just fun. It's much more interesting. Um, and not that we are eliminating um, some of the traditional stuff that we have done. But this, this, is, this is part of, I think, our um, commitment and our responsibility. Mm -hmm. we, need to, um, um, uh, the artists are entrepreneurial um, and Hope has talked about this, Aaron has talked about it, Shanita uh, has observed this. Artists are always gonna be entrepreneurial. We as a museum have a responsibility to the visual artists that come in. We need to assist them because we see what it takes yes. for them to get into the galleries, for them to get the show at the museum, for them to get their work really exposed to a wider audience, then we need to give them the business skill set that they need to marry with their practice so that they can be successful. I think that's part of our responsibility. So they're, they're, this, this notion of the business, it's like being relevant, mm -hmm. woke, if you will. Yeah. Um, having, um, if we have three slots to acquire um, art and two are BIPOC artists and one is not, that's what we have to do because it's going to be good for our business. And that's what we're seeing as well, the, the response uh, to us in terms of turning this into business, but not just uh, having uh, uh, not only sacrificing um, uh, financial gain, we, we do want to have that lens of what's that combination and, and how do we make this uh, um, fair? And it's going to look like BIPOC artists are ruling our, our we're leading in our decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, that's that tough part because someone may think as a leader, then oh, you're about to eliminate all the white artists. Mm -hmm. I've been told that. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it's like, well, mm, we have a lot of white artists already in our collection. And so how, how about we just balance it? Um, and this is something that my colleagues uh, that were um, um, uh, speaking about. And when it comes to the development of the program, this is why when we open the curtain, it just can't be the programming and the artistic ex exhibitions. It's gotta be, ooh, who's developing these programs? Who's designing the exhibitions? Who's the CFO managing all of the dollars associated with this, it has to also look like an inclusive um, organization. And when we when we have that, and that's what we're we're really leading into, then we have these very different innovative and creative um, and ideation type of uh, uh, ideas that that's really able to make the organi organization thrive. Wow. I love how you are folding equity into, you know, how oh. you're doing business. I mean, you're leading with that. And as you said, yeah. being fearless, as, as yeah. everyone on this panel is clearly. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's not a line item off to itself anymore. We're embedding it in every department in the institution because yes. that, that, that's how it has the only to way it'll work. 
or right or else it'll be just that check off like diversity was Here's a the, and it's not an order of fries exactly we're talking main course here yeah. Wow. So I have one question I'd like to ask the panel. What do you think re-emergence will look like in 2021? So we've been talking about the current state of things, what has been the impact of these uh, various pandemics that we've been experiencing. But based on this moment of reckoning, which America is now, you know, in the middle of, uh, you know, and the passion that our artists have, each of you has spoken as artists and advancing that, you know, what do you think? Reemergence will look like for the arts industry, arts field. Each of you, you can please respond. Well, for the museum, I uh, for the museum um, community, I think it's going to uh, look like uh, collaboration with partners that we have not partnered with before, mm -hmm. um, and listening because that is going to feed our a different type of action and a different set of policies. So to, to me, it's really collaboration um, okay. and uh, our the, listening to our various communities. Beautiful, thank you. Aaron? And, uh, I mean, my sense is kind of uh, maybe twofold. So one regarding the kind of racial equity D and I work um, I, I, I worry that the passion and the intensity will, will fade. Mm -hmm. I hope it won't, and I'm certainly going to do everything in my various roles to, to try to uh, keep that from happening, but I, I do worry. And so I basically, my answer is I'm unsure. Um, and I hope that the intensity and the passion continues and that we really see systemic policy shifts and evolution. For sure. Um, and then in terms of the actual practice, presentation, all of those types of things, I think that there's, a, you know, everyone says the new normal, right? But that it, it really will be that, that there will not be a full return and that there will basically be, of course, live amazing performances again, but that what we will have found as a field and as institutions, that there are parts that we are able to deliver with a level of value that the cost savings, the financial realities of mm -hmm. doing it digitally will um, dictate not to return to in-person things. I think certain conferences will mm -hmm. end up being probably hybrid. You'll have the core group of conference goers who want the in-person and who are part of institutions that can fund their attendance at conferences um, and or can personally fund it. But then I think you'll have this component of conferences that will remain digital. Uh, you know, there are at least a whole host of conferences that I'm aware of, their mm -hmm. conference attendance was up in 2020 because they were digital and so they had more people. That's so right. if you're actually stepping back in as organization and saying, we got more people to connect with the content that we have to offer, how do we balance that? So I think there will be a number of things that will be hybrid as mm -hmm. it relates to actual programming mm -hmm. based and driven by that value equation and ratio of in-person versus the cost and, and the valuation that could be created through digital work. I agree, thank you. I agree. Oh, sorry. I agree with Aaron about the hybrid. I think that that is, um, really what's going to happen considering that we can go to a different country from our living room and just yeah. still communicate all that we want to do. I think that that's key, but I also think what we can be in charge of is, um, and everyone has said it in their own way, but making sure we bring young people into the places that they need to learn or what they need to learn to be in these other fields, to, to guide them toward development, to guide them toward marketing. Because if we bring them, then we are assured that they will understand, yes, you may want to dance, that's great. Let me also teach you this. So the hour you spend in this class, you must also spend in development and learn how to fundraise and have inter internships and mentorships with young people so that we can teach them what they don't even know they don't know. So that then when 
a trip or a slip and a fall happens, they're prepared. And I think that's how we will really emerge over the long term. I honestly think 2021 is going to look like this as mm -hmm. for the for the scope, but 2022 might have more of I'm back because I'm not even sure if I want to sit elbow to elbow with someone. You know, do you did you get the vaccine? Are you I mean like like in my head, I'm not sure if I'm ready. And that's what I want more than anything. So right now I think that if we we accept the hybrid in learning and conferences in in communicating and then we are slowly moving in toward what can be in another year because this was dramatic for a lot of us. And I just commend all of you because I'm so thrilled. Like I said, this masterclass is um, off the chain. <laughs> so I'm so excited. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to echo what uh, my colleagues on this panel has said. I, I think moving forward, what I hope we don't do is sort of fix a broken system. I hope we remake the system. No band-aids yeah. here. Let's remake it. Yeah. Um, I do think that this thing that we sort of feared so much technology was going to sort of make people disengage with the arts. I think the flip happened. We learned that actually more people are engaging in the arts because it's more accessible. Now this notion around sort of monetizing, you know, we have become accustomed to sort of getting a lot of this content for free. Um, how do we sort of transition that so that it is a money-making proposition for organizations that need, um, need these resources to do this work? Um, and again, upskilling. So it's not like you hold your phone camera and, you know, tape hope dancing. Like it, it requires technology. It requires equipment. So sort of that um, intersection of the arts and technology it, it has arrived. So I think we were sort of, you know, hoping that it wouldn't come, but it is here. And as creatives do, as artists do, we're going to maximize it. You know, and I do hope that sort of moving forward that we have, you know, that the leadership starts to change and to look different. So there are a couple of things happening in New Jersey that I think will significantly impact the arts and culture sector. Uh, mainly the New Jersey Arts and Cult, um, Arts Administrators of Color program, mm -hmm. which is, I think is 60 or 80 people strong, um, primarily sort of early and mid-career arts administrators. You know, I hope that they move into these roles in the next three, five, 10 years. We also have the Nonprofit Professionals of Color Collective which is not just focused on arts administrators, but more broadly the nonprofit sector. And I think also this notion that artists are the original entrepreneurs. Um, I think we learned this so much when we had to really think about, especially for the P3 loan program, that nonprofits and arts organizations started to think of themselves as small businesses that individual artists started to think of themselves as small businesses mm -hmm. and the relationship with those entities, banking entities, the chambers of commerce, the downtown development authority, all of those things changed because we started to sort of understand that we were more connected than we thought, that the chamber of commerce really realized that the arts is an economic engine in a lot of communities, that these are, they're bringing people into communities, they're, supporting businesses and restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. And also, I hope that we also remember that arts and culture workers were some of the most vulnerable workers during the pandemic. Not mm -hmm. only did they lose their arts job, but they lost their side gig, many of them working in the hospitality industry. So these are folks that were in need of food assistance in need of rental assistance, in need of health care. So I also, again, hope that we sort of write this, um, this way of thinking, you know, that the arts and culture sector is critical, that artists are critical. There was a statewide pandemic fund that supported a lot of this relief efforts, but we also established the New Jersey Arts and Culture Recovery Fund. Yeah. And we've raised nearly over four and a half, three and a half million dollars to support small and mid-sized arts organizations right now because those are the ones that we under, most. understood were, were quite vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that the larger organizations and institutions are not as vulnerable, but these organizations tend to be less networked, have 
fewer resources, et cetera, um, organizations under $3 million. And we also looked at how they were serving, um, what their leadership looked like in terms of BIPOC communities. So we really wanted to make this um, support um, equitable in those ways as well. So, you know, understanding that the, the cultural landscape in New Jersey should be more reflective of the, the diversity of the folks in the community. But those are all things that we were thinking about. So I, I do hope what next looks like is that we actually learn from the thing, you know, take what we've learned to heart and implement the changes and make them sustainable so that we don't have to be in this situation again, so that we don't have um, culture workers, nearly 30,000 culture workers in the state. Um, and we don't want people to think of them as an afterthought. These are New Jersey residents. These are, you know, all over the country, really, folks that lost almost 100% of their resources due to, you know, according to national studies. So I think, I hope we can learn that we also have to prioritize this important sector is just as important as other sectors. Yes, wow, thank you, wow. Well, I think we should go to Q&A. There's two questions that I, if we have time, I'd like us to try to address. Um, one of those, Aaron was directed to you what can we do to ensure we do not lose this momentum? And because you have commented about that now twice. So what can we do? Yeah, such a great question. Um, and I would say acting within your own institution and or community. So in other words, making sure calling to task the leadership or if you are part of the leadership of that institution, taking it beyond issuing a statement uh, and saying, okay, now let's look at what we do and how can we look at our policies and change policies and begin to establish certain metrics so that, uh, so that two things happen. Number one, that as an institution or a community, we say, here is what success looks like as it relates to DE&I issues. And then a year from now, some type of metrics so you can look back and say, were we successful? With it, and all too often I see institutions um, not moving forward with that step. Sometimes just because it just doesn't happen, and mm -hmm. and the variety of just trying to keep an arts institution moving, uh, you know, uh, kind of gets caught up in it. But unfortunately, it also happens sometimes intentionally, because institutions or their leadership don't want to have to be accountable a year from now because they're they tend to be smart and they know that certain passions of the moment will fade. And so they know, let's just do what's necessary now, let's do the minimum, and then things will pass and we don't have to you know, turn over the cart. Uh, and I think just like you know, what Sharnita was saying, we don't wanna fix it, right? We wanna remake it. That requires right, these new processes, these new metrics, those mm -hmm. types of things. So I would say in terms of what can you do to make sure the momentum continues, following through on that, on whichever institutions are relevant for you, your community, your discipline, um, and, and overall the area or sphere of the arts that you're involved in. Mm, thank you, thank you. This other question I think is for uh, the panel. Where do we go from here with organizations that are not willing to be an anti-racist organization? What if we're not ready for that journey? What do we do? Um, so I'll, I'll tackle that, um, Donna, because the Dodge Foundation has created um, an equity framework for, it's for the Dodge Foundation. It mm. is a tool for us to really help us think about how we move forward in this work. It's on our website, grdodge.org. Um, it, again, it, it is something that was designed for Dodge and the organizations that we work with. Um, and it is a, a way that we can think about and talk about how we move forward um, in this work. And for some organizations, they are not going to fit. They are not going to go on this journey with us. And that's okay. It is okay. Twisting sort of we have been saying, you know, don't twist yourself in a pretzel for, for these resources. 
because what we're looking for is long-term sustainable change and it will be evident. So, um, you know, this is work is not for everybody. It's not for every organization, okay. although it should be. It is not. It is not for the hate, for the faint of heart, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are going to go on this journey with the folks that want to go on this journey with us. And we're going to go far. Um, and perhaps they will catch up. Okay. Can I, just throw, can I just throw a little of the entrepreneurial uh, uh, side of me in there uh, as well, which is if, if the organization that's in your community doesn't want to, isn't engaging in the work, start your own. The orchestra's, you know, uh, unwilling or uninterested, start your own. The mm -hmm. dance company, theater companies, unwilling to engage in this work, start your own. And then that's when you really see, because if your community values it, if certain key members or, or partners in the philanthropic community value it, then those resources will become more attracted to the work that you're doing. And either you will have been the key catalyst for that institution to now say, we got to make a big change, or ultimately you could end up becoming the succession organization that really ends up being the dominant force in your community. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, I think we have time. Yeah, we can do another question. So uh, the, thank you to all the panelists. I appreciate the comment Linda made on embarking into new partnerships. I'm interested in learning how you and your organization are thinking about weaving equity into partnerships with both new and existing partners. You know what, um, this is where um, I'll probably put a plug in for uh, the Dodge Foundation's um, equity framework, um, because we took that and um, spent pretty much uh, a good part of maybe four or five hours with our staff and uh, with our trustees, uh, because there is a piece, there's a segment of it that you need a lot of work. <laughs> and and there, it, it could be, this is where an organization starts. Um, but this was a way for us to have um, every department look at and um, do a self-assessment. Where are you? Okay. Where are you? in your department and you would think oh um and and we had some folks say you know we're the uh, facilities team this is th this doesn't really apply to us no. yes it does <laughs> and that and that this is how um we've been embedding this so that um it is uh uh the framework and the language that everyone across the organization then um can use and you're not at the same place in different areas. I, I think there are, there are like six, there, there's, there's our, uh, how, is this, how does it look for us in a, a, with our staff, our trustees, um, uh, the, the makeup of our trustees and staff. And so it forced us to actually look at the diversity makeup of the city of Newark and break it down. Mm -hmm. And how do we look internally compared to the city of Newark? And it's right there in black and white. And it said, oh, we got some work to do. But then we also looked at it in terms of um, how are we impacting the, um, uh, our industry? So our way of getting um, then um, uh, uh, our partners engaged in this, this is how we talk to our future partners. This is how we say, you know what? We're the institution here, the, the, the Museum of Art. We need to reach out to the smaller organizations or to the entrepreneurial organizations, to that ecosystem of uh, the art community that may not um, know that we should be talking uh, together. So we should reach out to them. We're also looking at how we uh, look at our education, our uh, someone like Rutgers, uh, um, and how, how do we work with them? What is it that we can do? So we, we feel that's part of our job to reach out and particularly to those organizations that we know, um, they may not even, they may be struggling to pay the phone bill mm -hmm. month to month, but, but they, they are part of the fabric of the art world here um, in Newark. So we're, we're trying to have our, no matter what department you're in, for you to be able to talk to the vendors, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. the people that you may uh, work with, the educators, for you to have that same language, not just have this language um, at the leadership level. In fact, mm -hmm. what we are saying is that we are uncovering the leaders throughout the organization. And, and this is a way that we can start really setting that policy and making others aware of what we're doing, and this will also help them, we, we hope, um, uh, if they have not um, had the opportunity to have the training around diversity um, and inclusion and equity. And so us sharing with them how we see this, how we work, whether it's a program that we develop or whether um, it's a strategy behind um, our uh, financial uh, stability with our CFO, or whether it's with our just general outreach. We're trying to embed this. And at literally today, trustee board meeting, mm -hmm. and we shared with them, we will be monitoring this every quarter. How are we doing against this framework in these different areas in each department? It's a way that we think we won't get peter out as as uh, Aaron says and get lost and then all of a sudden we're not doing it it was just the 2020 you know soup of the moment yeah yeah well, i want to quickly add that we also have an internal equity rubric so we are shining the light on ourselves our staff our board our investments how you know where we're directing dollars so we are not we're holding ourselves accountable as well yes and, you know, I think that's such an important point, Sharnita. Uh, we're doing the same at NJPAC as well, having our own internal equity rubric and really looking at how do we be as inclusive and equitable as possible, not just externally uh, with these wonderful masterclasses that we're able to, to present, but also how are we doing the work ourselves? So I think that's when you really see the success. And so that's so amazing. You know, listening to, to everyone, I can really understand the importance of this kind of dialogue, uh, but also the leadership, because each of you are leaders. Each of you have talked about, I'm moving forward. Now you come with me, but I'm going anyway. I mean, Hope is gonna be conquering the whole dance world in two minutes, you know? And the strength of your legacy, you wear that like a coat and that it's so beautiful to hear, you know, your constant references to your mother, you know, and how her voice is in your ear and that's, how you can advance with total confidence, nothing to worry about, you know? And of course the entrepreneurship, um, Aaron, I think if, if the more artists can think about the business of the arts and create your own. Okay, so how long are we gonna try to beat these people to understand, or I'm gonna build my own house and I have the intelligence and the resources to do it, you know? And Linda, thank you so much for your leadership at the museum because you are providing a model, an example, you know, between your board and your staff programming of exactly how museums can transform. You know, Darren Walker had given a speech recently about museums and just saying how, you know, really closed, you know, that world is and you're just blowing it up. So thank you for that. Sharnita, the initiatives that the Dodge Foundation has developed in equity and inclusion and your personal you know, focus on that has really provided the city with such great jewels. So I thank you for all of that thinking, resources and continuing to expand. And so thank you panel, you have been absolutely incredible. I can't tell you what it's a joy to have all of you in the same room. You know, we will have to find other ways to make this happen. I'm sure we will. Uh, and I hope that everyone who's listening has been able to glean uh, some information from this. So I'm going to turn this back over to our producer, Katab Rollins. Wow. Wow. I know, right? Wow. Bravo. I, you know, I don't have words really to share besides thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights and your expertise and your wisdom. And uh, I'm looking forward. And thank you to our our uh, our attendees. I hope you I hope you gathered. I hope you took something from what each of our panelists had to say and offer. I'm certainly I feel full. Um, and so thank you all. Um, before we go, I would like to thank invite everyone to two very important events that NGPAC is hosting this week. 
The first is a ticketed virtual performance by the one and only Let Us See that takes place tomorrow evening. You can go to njpack.org for more information and to buy tickets. But the piece de resistance is the 22nd annual Kwanzaa Festival and celebration happening this Saturday. We have a litany, a smorgasbord of free virtual events for the entire family. And all you have to do is go to njpack.org slash Kwanzaa to check out the vast offerings. And you can also, also support some Black-owned businesses by shopping in our virtual Kwanzaa marketplace. So thank you, panel. Thank you, audience. Um, we'll see you again on January 18th for the next installment of our social justice series, The Black Experience in Business. And to close us out, please enjoy this video by Aaron entitled Breathe. Thank you. Uh, one, how do I get that? My wrist, man. Okay, okay. I want to lay on the ground. 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 I'm going down. I'm going down. I'm going down. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Let go of me, man. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please, man, please listen to me. Please listen to me. Forgery? For what? For what? I can't fucking breathe, man. I can't fucking breathe. Thank you. Thank you. I can't believe this. I can't believe this, man. Mom, I love you. I love you. Tell my kids I love them. I'm dead. I can't breathe or nothing, man. This cold-blooded, man. Ah! 
Mama, I love you. I can't do nothing. My face is gone. I can't breathe, man. Please, please let me stand. Please, man, I can't breathe. My face is getting bad. Please, I can't breathe. Please, man. Please, man. Please, man. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Uh, I'll probably just die this way. I can't breathe. My face. I can't breathe. Please. I can't breathe. Shit. I will. I can't move my knee, my neck. I'm through, I'm through. I'm claustrophobic, my stomach hurts, my neck hurts, everything hurts. I need some water or something, please, please. I can't breathe, officer. You're going to kill me, man. Come on, man. Oh, oh, I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe. Ah, they'll kill me. They'll kill me. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please. Please. Please.